Hey, Evangel Church, it's so great to be here with you this morning. And I don't know where you are, uh, even what device you're watching this on, but my prayer and our prayer for you is that you feel loved, you feel cared for, and you know that we are the church. It doesn't matter where we are. In the church of Jesus Christ, um, it, it doesn't stop just because you can't meet together in a single building. No, the church of Jesus Christ is you and I together. And so let me pray for you this morning. God, God, we pray that you would touch each and every person's heart this morning, that the message, that the worship today would be sincere. It's not just the YouTube video playing, but we're coming together as the church of Jesus Christ, um, uh, scattered throughout Kelowna and beyond. And I pray, God, that, that lives would be transformed by the message and the reading of the word. We love you, God, and I pray over each and every person that they would feel cared for and that they would feel your presence today. In Jesus' name. Now let's join together with our worship team. There is a truth older than the ages. There is a promise of things yet to come. There is one born for our salvation. Jesus. There is a light that overwhelms the darkness. There is a kingdom that forever reigns. There is freedom from the chains that bind us. Jesus, Jesus, who works on the waters. No one like you. 
No one like you, Jesus. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Oh, my soul. Worship His holy name. Sing like never before. Oh, my soul. I worship Your holy name. The sun up, it's a new day dawning, it's time to sing your song again, whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the evening comes, bless the Lord. Welcome to Evangel Church Online, and thanks so much for being here. And I wanted to take a few minutes and share a couple things for you and your family. Now, maybe today's your first time tuning in with Evangel Church, or maybe you've been part of this church for years, but either way, we're so happy that you've joined with us today. And it doesn't stop here. Now, you can come visit us online at evangelcolona.com, or uh, you can link in with our social media accounts. And these social media accounts will alert you to upcoming events and online meetups. This week, we'd love to have you join us at our monthly prayer summit. 
Now, we're not gonna stop gathering for prayer, are we? We're gonna continue to pray in homes, but we're also gonna continue to pray in our monthly prayer summit. It's gonna be happening this Wednesday at 6.30. So tune in online, go to our website, our YouTube account, and you'll be able to uh, join in with us again Wednesday at 6.30 p.m. Also, today is gonna be really special. I know lots of you are missing connecting with friends in our church lobby following our Sunday services. Well, today at 11 a.m. following this presentation, we'll be opening an online church foyer using Zoom. Now just head over to our website and follow the online foyer Zoom instructions and pop on for a few minutes and say hello. Myself, Pastor Will, and others will be there to greet you and, and it's just gonna be a really great time. So again, go to our website, follow the instructions for Zoom, and we'll see you around 11 a.m. Well, thanks so much for giving, church. You know, uh, if you're new with us, don't feel any obligation to give. But if you're part of our church family, we would encourage you to give faithfully. The best way to do that is this. Number one, online. Number two, through text. You take your mobile device and you text the words Evangel Kelowna to 77977 and follow the prompts. And three in person. Our church office is still open Tuesday to Thursday, 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. Now let's take a few moments to check in with uh, Pastor Josh and Nicole, our EC Kids pastors. Meet Paul. He was an apostle of Jesus Christ. He went around telling everyone about Jesus and his message. But some people hated that Paul was talking about Jesus, so they threw him in prison. Can you imagine what it would have been like to be in prison? How do you think you would feel? Paul probably felt uh, sad and moped around and felt sorry for himself, right? Wrong. He actually was rejoicing in prison. He knew that what happened to him helped reach more people with the good news of Jesus because everyone knew that he was in chains for the gospel. Paul could rejoice because he put all of his hope in Jesus. He knew that whether he was in jail or if he was free or even if he died, that he was going to be with Jesus. Now, do you guys see this sponge here? This sponge, if you put it in something, it'll just fill up with whatever it's being put into. And then if you squeeze it, whatever is inside is gonna come out. Now we have two bowls here. One bowl is full of really dirty water, and the other bowl is full of nice, clean water. Now if we put the sponge in the dirty water, and then we squeeze it, what's gonna come out? Gross, gross water. <laughs> But if we put the sponge in the clean water and then we squeeze it, what's gonna come out? Nice, squeaky clean water. These sponges are like us. Bad things or hard things can happen to us in our lives and we can feel like we're getting squeezed. Maybe in the situation that we're all in right now, you feel like you're being squeezed. I know I do. So just like when a sponge is squeezed and whatever's in it starts coming out, when we feel squeezed, what we feel inside of us starts to come out. So now I'm not, I'm not talking about the lunch you had, okay? I'm talking about your feelings and emotions, your character, what you believe and how you see the world. These are the things that start to come out of us when we feel squeezed. So when our lives are filled with things that aren't from God, like anger and jealousy, selfishness, pride and fear, those things start to come out of us. But when we live our lives with God, he fills us full of love and joy, peace and hope, so that when we're squeezed, that's the kind of stuff that can come out of us. It's just like Paul. When Paul was in prison being squeezed by life, he was able to rejoice because he was living his life with God. You know, Paul said in Philippians 1 verse 21, he said, For me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. What Paul meant is that he was basically saying he couldn't lose. Either he was alive and he was with Jesus and doing the work of Jesus, 
or if he died, he would be with God in person forever. It is your classic can't lose situation. So if you're feeling squeezed by life and bad things are starting to come out of you, it's okay. You know, we've all been there, but we don't have to stay there. Choosing to spend time with God today is the first step to changing what's going on inside of us. God fills us with his hope. He fills us with his peace. You know, he changes how we see everything around us. Let's pray together. Five, four, three, two, one. Jesus, we thank you for the hope that we have in you. That even in the midst of the circumstances of life and the ways that we get squeezed, that we can trust you and that you fill us with your peace. We love you, Jesus, and we look to you. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Now, we believe God has something incredibly special to say to you and encourage you today. May you be inspired as Pastor Will gives his word. Let's join him now. Well, good morning, everybody, and thanks for, uh, for joining us this morning. Uh, just before we get into the sermon, just a few shout-outs to some folks in our church. Uh, first of all, Ernie Campbell, it's your 90th birthday today. Did you know that? Congratulations, 90, that's amazing. You know, Ernie used to work at, um, at Costco. He would be one of the guys who would be handing out the samples, you know, and every time I came to Costco, Ernie would give me double the samples. So thanks for that, Ernie, and thanks for being you, and we love you. Happy 90th, uh, 90th birthday. And then uh, shout out to Bob Hardy. Uh, Bob has uh, organized a crew of volunteers who they come and they've been weeding the flower beds and the, uh, the, like the boulevards at the church and stuff. And so even though we can't uh, meet, you know, physically at the church these days, uh, they're making sure that, uh, that God's property is looking good and keeps in good shape. So thanks, Bob, and all the volunteers for doing that. And uh, God bless you for, for helping us out in that way. And then Katie Rothen. You know, Pastor John's wife, Katie, she did something amazing. So you know that during this, uh, this time of, you know, self-isolation, that, you know, kids who would normally have a birthday party and they'd invite their friends over for their birthday party, they can't do that, right? So they just have like a little birthday party at home. Well, Katie, uh, she uh, loves everything Disney, and she has these Disney character costumes, and what she did is uh, she dressed up in some of these character costumes. You kind of put it out to people, you know, would anybody like a birthday video sent to their kid in Disney character costume? And so about 40 people respond and say, yeah, we'd love that. And so she created 40 of these little videos that have been sent to, you know, kids on their birthday and stuff, and it's just putting a smile on kids' face. So well done, Katie. I mean, that's amazing. The Kelowna Capital News picked up on it, and it's just a way of using your talent to do something good to help people. So thanks. Shout out to Katie. Well done. Let me just uh, say a couple of things to all of our volunteers. Uh, this week is National Volunteer Week. And of course, this would be the time of year when we would have normally, you know, been just affirming all of our volunteers, hundreds of volunteers. We would have had our, you know, our big uh, volunteer appreciation night, and we were planning that. And of course, we haven't been able to hold that because we can't, you know, gather in big groups and so on. But uh, we just want to say how much we appreciate you. And I know, for those of you who, you know, regularly volunteer at the church, you're missing you know, you're missing out on, on, on actually serving the Lord alongside other people, and you're missing the fellowship, the, you know, of just working together with other people, and, uh, but we want you to know that your work has not gone unnoticed, and we're looking forward to the time when we'll be able to gather together again, and you'll be able to be serving here again, but we just want you to know we do love you, and we appreciate the work that you do for the Lord, so God bless you. I want to invite you to turn with me this morning to Philippians chapter 1. So if you've got your Bible handy there, Philippians chapter 1. And today we're, we're starting a, a new series on, based on Paul's letter to the church at Philippi. And the new series is entitled Philippians, 
making the most of isolation. <laughs> making the most of isolation. Now, this is something we can all relate to, right? Because we're, we're all facing some form of isolation these days. And, um, and in fact, the, the truth is, you're watching this message online because we can't gather, you know, in a big group, right? Like we normally do on a Sunday. You're watching this message online from some form or some place of isolation. So you're experiencing that even right now. Now, I think that some of you are enjoying this isolation too much. I'm hearing reports that people are watching the services in their pajamas. <laughs> other, other people are, are enjoying this because now you can come and you, you, can, you can have your coffee cup and you don't have to have it covered like we do when you come into the sanctuary. So some of you are enjoying this too much. Now listen, don't, don't get used to this. When we come back together and one day we will come back together, I don't want to see a bunch of people in front of me in pajamas, okay? So some of you are enjoying it a lot and, and that's okay. But for others and for many people, this isolation is hard. It's hard. For many of us, I think you'd have to agree, the novelty is kind of worn off. You're getting bored, right? I mean, it's been five weeks, but it seems like a, a lifetime. And for some of you, you say, this thing's getting old. Um, some of you, you are parents who now are faced up with the, you know, the challenges of... Uh, of you know, homeschooling your kids or working from home. And normally you'd said the kids off to daycare or off to school, but now they're with you 24 seven. And that's not easy, you know, and it's part of being isolated. And you know, some of you, you just wanna hug your grandkids or you just wanna hug your parents, but, but because you don't wanna cause them harm or bring harm to them, you can't do that right now. Uh, some of us, you know, we've got sick people in the hospital. My dad's going in for a surgery this week and, and because of the protocols and so on, and I understand, but we're not going to be able to visit him while he's in the hospital. And so this isolation, it's, it's not easy for a lot of people. Well, the apostle Paul, who's, who's writing this epistle to the church at Philippi, he understands isolation because he's writing this from a place of isolation. Now, for him, it wasn't like self-isolation. It was like a forced isolation. You see, Paul is writing this letter under house arrest in Rome. And uh, now, look, the, the kind of house arrest uh, that he's experiencing is different from the house arrest people might experience today. If people under ho house arrest in, in Canada, they might have one of those ankle bracelets, right, that tracks their movements. In that day, Paul the apostle, when he was under house arrest, he was literally chained to a guard 24 seven. And you think about how challenging and how humbling this must have been for the apostle Paul. I mean, here's a guy who is used to so, having so much independence and traveling around freely. Do you, do you remember what independence was like? You know, a lot of us, you know, we've lost a lot of our independence. But here, here's a guy who, 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 uh, who has been used to traveling through Europe and Asia, planting churches, just like pouring himself into the lives of leaders. And now where is he? He's in Rome under house arrest, chained to a guard 24 hours a day. I mean, think about this. I mean, if, if he wants to go for a walk, this guy goes with him, right? If he, if he wants to take a nap, this guy is right there with him. If he has to go to the bathroom, this guy is right there. Not too much fun for Paul. Not the greatest of circumstances, this house arrest, this isolation. And yet, as you read through this short letter to the Philippians, four short chapters, Never once do we hear Paul complaining or grumbling about his circumstances. In fact, on the contrary, we hear someone who talks about actually making the most out of the difficult situation he finds himself in, making the most out of his isolation. See, Paul knew something about God, and he knew some things about life that really helped him. And maybe as we go through this series, we'll discover some things that will help us as we're right in the midst of our own isolation. So let's begin reading at verse 12 of chapter one of Philippians. Verse 12, Paul writes, I want you to know brothers and sisters 
that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers have become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment and are much bolder to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. He goes on. He says, yes, and I will rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance as it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. What did Paul know that helped him in the midst of the isolation that he was facing? What, what did he know about God? What did he know about life that, that helped him? And, and what can we come to know that will help us as well? Well, for one thing, he, Paul went into the isolation knowing this. He knew that sometimes life is just hard. It's hard. Now, we, we shouldn't even have to say this, that life is hard. And, and, and Paul wouldn't have had to say that directly because people would have known that. In his day, people knew that life was hard because life was hard for many, many people in that day. But in our day, we need to point this out because so many people in our culture don't know this, that sometimes life is just meant to be hard. Many of us have, have kind of grown up in the culture where people are trying to do everything that they can to make sure that life is not hard. Now, I'm not saying that you should go looking for a hard life. But the truth is, people aren't expecting it. They think life should be easy. So when something hard comes along, it completely throws them off their game. And I actually think that's one of the reasons why people are struggling so much with what we're going through in COVID-19, this crisis. Because this is the hardest thing that people have ever had to face in their life. And it's not that it's their fault. It's, it's not anything that they did to cause this. It's just life, because sometimes life is just hard. And knowing that, that life is hard, can actually help us to get through a difficult time because it helps us with the disappointment that we can face sometimes when hardship comes, or at least it helps us deal with the disappointment. You see, when we, if we think that life should always be easy, then when hardship comes, we're gonna be di severely disappointed. But if we know that sometimes life is hard, well, it'll help us. You see, the Apostle Paul, he knew that life wasn't always gonna be easy. In fact, he was expecting that it wouldn't. He, he knew that there were gonna be some hardships that would come along. And so when he faced the hardships, like being isolated in Rome, chained to a guard, guess what? He didn't get all bent out of shape. Instead, he set his mind on, on trying to, to, to figure out how to make the most out of this very difficult situation. And so that's the first thing he knew. Sometimes life is hard. And then the second thing that helped Paul, and this is the thing I really wanna focus on. Paul knew this. Paul understood that God has the unique ability to work things out for the good. Let me say that again. God has the ability to work things out for the good. God has the unique ability to actually take some really bad things, things that are bad, things that are difficult, things that are hard, and actually turn those things around for good for his purpose and for his own glory. I, I, how many of you have discovered that in your own life? <laughs> I have. There were some things that have happened to me in my life I certainly would not have chosen. But you know what? God took those things, those bad things, those difficult things, and actually turned them around to do something good and make something good for his purpose and for my benefit. And Paul understands that God has a way of doing that. He has a way of turning bad things 
for good for his own purpose. And we see all that coming out in a couple of places here. First of all, in verse 12, he says, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. And then down to verse 19. I want you to know that the things that have happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. And and you know what he's saying? He's saying, look, I, I know that this, as bad as it is, is going to, first of all, work out for the historical good, you know, good things are going to happen historically that history will show. And secondly, these bad things, God is going to use them to turn out good for me personally in my life, going to help me personally. So let's look at what he's talking about here, verse 12. He says, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And here's what Paul is saying. He says, look, here I am chained day and night to these guards. <laughs> and you Philippians, I care about you. And I know you care about me. And you think this is a bad thing. But listen, don't worry about that. God is actually taking this thing that is bad and turning it out for a, to be a good thing. Because you know what? Here's the thing. Some of these guards are coming to Christ. And as they come to Christ, they go and share with the other guards and the other guards are coming to Christ. And we got like a mini revival happening here in Rome in this place of prison. I mean, can you imagine being one of these guards chained to the Apostle Paul like 24-7? I mean, here's the greatest evangelist like in the history of the world and and you're chained to him. And guess what? He's going to be sharing the gospel and he's going to be sharing it in such, you know, in the power of the Holy Spirit. That guard or those guards who were chained to him, they didn't stand a chance. They were going to get saved. And that's exactly what happened. Now look, Paul didn't plan this. Right? He didn't plan this. He, he would have rather been out planting churches and, you know, ministering to other pastors and pouring his life into their lives. But, but he didn't plan to be planting a church in prison. And yet that's exactly what's happening. Because here, Paul knows something very true. And it says, God is in the business of turning bad things into good things if we let him. Let me say that again. God is in the business of turning bad things into good things if we let him. Matthew Henry, great Bible scholar and commentary, lived in the 1600s, wrote one of the the most well-known commentaries on the New Testament in the last 400 years. And and he, as he was uh, commenting on this, this passage in Philippians, he said this, he said, Paul is claiming that God is the only alchemist. Paul is claiming that God is the only alchemist. Now, what does he mean by that? And and what's an alchemist? Well, an alchemist was a person who lived in the Middle Ages. And uh, they were kind of like a scientist in a way. And they were trying to discover a way to turn lead into gold, right? Because they had tons of lead. It was all over the place, but it was basically worthless, whereas gold was something that was very precious. And they were working away at it for years and years, trying to figure out a way to turn lead, which was worthless, into gold, which was valuable. And of course, they never were really able to do that. But what Matthew Henry is saying is that what Paul is claiming here is that This is what God does with the circumstances of our life. He's like the divine alchemist. He's, he's, He's the one who's taking the worthless parts of our life and turning them into something precious for his own purposes. And so Paul says to the Philippians, don't feel sorry for me. God is actually using this isolation to do something good, to advance the gospel, and much good is coming from it. So it's going to have a historical benefit. Many, many people are coming to Christ. But then Paul takes it a step further, and he personalizes the good that's going to come out of this. So in verse 19, he will say, not only is God working a historical good through this circumstance, but he is actually using this to bring something good personally in my life. And so he says in verse 19, yes, and I will rejoice For I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, that this will turn out for my deliverance. Do you know the actual translation in the Greek for that word deliverance? You know what it is? It's the word salvation. And so what Paul is saying here is is, is what's happening to me is, 
is actually saving me. It's turning out for not only my benefit, but, but it's saving me. Now, just take a time out here because we're not just saying that Paul is being saved, you know, in the sense that we often talked about salvation uh, through this circumstance. Let me explain. We know that the Bible, when it talks about salvation, it talks about it in three different tenses, right? So there's a past tense where when we commit our life to Christ, when we surrender our life to Jesus, we are saved from the penalty of sin, right? We call that justification, where Jesus on the cross took our penalty of sin upon himself. And when we put our faith in what he has done in the finished work of Christ on the cross, we are saved from the penalty of sin. That's in the past tense. In the present tense, we are saved, we know, from the power of sin. We call this sanctification, right? So, so in other words, you know, uh, Christ is working in us and he's developing us to become more and more like Christ. And in that sense, we're being saved from the power of sin. There are, there are, there are uh, bondages and the effects of sin that were more predominant in our life that aren't now because we're being changed and we're developing and Christ has a part in that and we have a part in that. So that's in the present tense. And then there's a future tense where one day we'll be saved from the presence of sin, right? And we call that glorification that we'll be in heaven. And one day there'll be that place where there's no more sin or the effects of sin. And we will be saved in that sense. So, so there's this past, present, and future tense. You've been saved from the penalty of sin. You're being saved from the power of sin. You will be saved from the presence of sin. Well, when Paul is talking about here, is he's being saved in the present tense. He is actually saying that because of what is happening, because of the challenge and the difficulty and the, the time of testing, he is being saved from the power of sin because God is using this to refine him and make him into the person that God wants him to be. And so in that sense, he's saying that God is like the divine alchemist. He's the one that's turning the lead of my life into gold. And, and not only is, is he turning my situation into gold, he's turning me into gold. Do you see what he's saying here? Paul is actually saying, I need this thing because God is gonna use this thing to help me to become more and more like Jesus. And what he's actually saying is this, is God is using this difficult situation to save me from myself. He's saying there are things in my life that need adjustment, I need change. I didn't know about it until I went through this difficult time, until I was in this place of isolation. And those things would have never been revealed unless I went through this time of testing. And unless they were revealed, I, I couldn't change them. I, I couldn't see the way. And, and it only came about because of the pressure of this isolation. Now, let me get real personal here. <laughs> let me ask you the question today. Could it be that the isolation that you are facing right now, as difficult as it is, could it be that this is something that God will use to reveal areas in your life that need to be changed? Areas in your life that need adjustment. Areas in your life that may need repentance. Let me ask you, are you noticing that there are some things in your life that are becoming more magnified? <laughs> because you're going through this difficult and challenging time? Are you noticing that maybe fears that you didn't have before, or you didn't notice before, that all of a sudden you're more afraid of stuff? Um, are, 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 you, are you noticing that you have less patience than you used to be? You know, you got the kids around all the time and all this stuff, this time of isolate, it's revealing something and you have less patience. Maybe some of you, you're discovering you didn't have as much self-control as you had. Some of you, are you struggling with, with paranoia? Is that like really rising to the surface? You're believing and getting drawn into all sorts of conspiracy theories about you know, COVID and all this kind of stuff. Others of you, are you, are you feeling more and more overwhelmed? Are there, are there parts of your life that are rising to the surface these days and, and you're disturbed by that? Here's what I'm saying. Maybe we need to pay attention to some of those things. Uh, it may not be everything, but some of those things God may be wanting to speak to us about. Maybe some of those things are, are areas where we need to grow and we need to change. You know, Paul, he had come to the place 
And this was amazing to me. He had come to the place where he saw that this isolation, he saw it as a gift, not a burden. I don't know if I've completely come to that place yet, but he had come to that place because he saw that this was the means that God was using to get his attention so that he could see the things that needed to change and be adjusted and, 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 and need to be repented of so that he could look more like Christ. And so here's my question to you. That was his story. Will that be your story? Will, will you come out of this time of isolation looking more and more like Christ? Will you use, allow God to use this time to turn some of the lead in your life into gold? It seems like that's what Paul did. That was his story. And here's the thing. Part of the reason, I think, why Paul could come out of the isolation in better shape was because he knew something. And this is the final thing I want to say here today. It's this, that Paul really knew what defined his life. You see, Paul knew this, that his life wasn't so much defined by his circumstance. It wasn't so much defined by a situation as difficult as that was. You know what defined Paul's life? It was Christ. In fact, you know, Paul's life could be defined in six words. For me to live is Christ. For me to live is Christ. That's what defined Paul's life. And that's the key reason why he could experience joy and peace in the midst of isolation, being chained to a Roman guard because Paul had made a serious decision that his life would be defined by Christ and Christ alone. You know, Paul knew something very, very important, and it was this. How you define your life is absolutely critical to how you will handle your life. Let me say that again. Paul knew this. How you define your life is absolutely critical to how you handle your life. If you've got a proper definition of life, Paul says you'll be able to face anything, even isolation, and come out of it stronger. When Paul says, for me to live is Christ, he's saying that this is the thing that is life for me. This is the bottom line for me. This is the most important thing to me. If I have this, if I have Christ, then I'm living regardless of what is taken away from me. Let's think about some alternatives for a moment. What if somebody says, well, for me to live is pleasure. Well, what happens if your quality of life is taken away? You're not gonna experience much joy or peace, are you? What if somebody says, for me to live is, is to really be in control of everything? Well, what happens when things out of control? You're gonna lose your sense of peace, aren't you? What if somebody says, well, for me to live is my job. Well, what happens if you lose your job? Then you're not going to have any peace. You're not going to experience joy. But Paul says, you know what? There's actually only one definition of life that will stand up to anything. And he gives it to us. And it says, for me to live is Christ. That's the bottom line for me. That's my definition of life. That's what helps me to experience joy and peace no matter what happens to me. It is Christ who defines my life. And because of that, there's nothing that I can't face up to, even isolation. You know, this isolation has taken a lot of things away from us. And it has. That's true. There's a lot of things that we enjoy that we are not able to enjoy right now because of this time of isolation. But here's the truth. There's one thing that isolation can never take away from you. And you know what that is? It's Jesus. <laughs> can I hear an amen out there today? <laughs> it's Jesus. You can't be taken. The presence of Jesus, no isolation, no difficulty can take the presence of Jesus away from you. The Bible says in Romans 8, there's nothing that can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord, not even isolation. If you allow your life to be defined by Jesus, even this isolation can turn out for good. And so here are some uh, questions to consider this week, just to ponder. You, you may want to write these down. You may want to just pause the, you know, the, the recording and just, just kind of write, write these down, just for thought this week. Allow God to speak to you. First of all, number one, question number one, what does God want me to learn about myself? 
through this time of isolation and allow God to speak to you about that. God, what do you want to teach me about myself through this time of isolation that I could have never learned about myself other than this? Question number two, what character trait does God want to develop in me through this time of isolation, through this time of difficulty? What, what, what part of the, the lead of my life does God want to turn into gold through this time? And ask God to reveal that to you, and he'll do that. And then thirdly, how can I allow this isolation to be used to reflect Christ to other people? You know, I mean, that's what Paul the apostle did, didn't he? Rather than moping around complaining about all the things he missed, no, he, he's there saying, you know, God's going to use this. God's going to allow me to share with these guards that I'm chained to. And, and, and that happened, and they came to Christ. How, how is God going to use this time for you to reflect Christ to other people around you? Just some questions for reflection this week, and I hope you'll, you'll do that. Let me close with this scripture that I came across this week. I, I think it is so appropriate for the time we live in and is, and is so challenging and so encouraging. It's Psalm 66, 10 to 12. It may be a, a scripture that you want to memorize during this time, but, but here it is, three verses. For you, God, tested us, and we're being tested now. For you, God, tested us, and you refined us like silver or like gold. You brought us into prison, right? It's like this time of isolation. You brought us into prison and, and laid burdens on our backs. You let people ride over our heads. We went through fire and water, but you brought us to a place of abundance. Hallelujah. Oh, I, that's, that's, that's the promise that I hope you'll carry with you through this time of testing that we would allow this time to refine us and test us so that we could become more and more like Jesus. But out of this time, we would actually come into a place of abundance in our life because God is using this time to help us to look more and more like Jesus. We're gonna conclude today just with a song of surrender. And I wanna encourage you to allow the words of this familiar song to go deep into your life, into your heart. And, uh, and as, you know, maybe you're humming the words, you're reflecting on the words, that you would actually come to that place of surrender. And, and in a fresh way, you would surrender your life to Jesus and say, Jesus, I need you. But Jesus, I want whatever you want to do in my life, I want to surrender that to you. And in this moment, I surrender my life to you for you to do the work that you want to do in my life so that I might come out of this time in a place of abundance. So God bless you as you listen to the words, and God bless you this week. Amen. Lord, I come, I confess, bowing here, I find my fall apart You're the one that guides my heart Lord I need you Oh I need you Every hour I need you My one defense my right
temptation comes my way And when I cannot stand I fall on you Jesus you're my hope and stay And when I cannot stand I fall on you Jesus you're my Oh, 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 oh,